about NVMe error logging. And the reason I wanted to talk about NVMe error logging is because now that we're having more of our customers starting to use this technology, particularly NVMe over Fabric, it's become apparent that it can be difficult to troubleshoot things like connection issues or other problems with the logging that we currently have in place in the kernel. Um, in particular, um, if you hook up a storage device and it doesn't work, it can be very difficult to figure out why that is. Um, so there's a couple things. One is that there's several differences between the kinds of errors that we log for SCSI, which is uh, the, at least for the type of technology I'm most familiar with, which is fiber channel. Um, the types of errors that you get with uh, uh, SCSI over fiber channel versus, for example, NVMe over fiber channel. Um, but it's also, for also a somewhat of a more generic issue. We see this sometimes with customer reports of errors with NVMe PCI devices where uh, a customer tries to use an NVMe PCI device in the system um, and it doesn't operate as expected and it's difficult to figure out why. So one of the things was that um, SCSI error logging in general has gone on, undergone a bunch of changes over the past several years. In some cases we've slimmed down the error logging um, we've trimmed out a bunch of nuisance messages, um, but also we've added a little bit more detail um, for things like errors on commands where we actually show the CDB, we show how long the command was outstanding when we got the error, things like that. So um, there's been some proposals. I haven't actually submitted any patches for this yet, though I have some patches I've had in development for a while that I'm still toying with. And really, I kind of wanted this to be sort of a more open general discussion about what do we want to actually have this look like. Um, we, I don't think necessarily want to go to a very verbose model for NVMe, but we do want to provide enough detail to, so that when something's wrong, we can pinpoint what the cause is. All right, so does anybody have any questions about that before I go into a little bit more detail about what I'm talking about? All right, so with NVMe over fabrics, there's sort, of th there's sort of effectively three phases, right? There's the discovery phase where you're finding out about the uh, device uh, storage endpoints that you're going to make connections to. Um, and then there's the connection phase where you're establishing the connections. And then there's when you're actually doing I.O. and you get errors and uh, what type of errors you see there. So um, with the discovery phase, one of the problems that we have seen is that the way that NVMe over Fabrics operates, when we do a uh, get discovery log page, we typically see all the entries that the device is reporting, even if you don't necessarily have connectivity to those ports on the device, or even if it's not the same uh, transport type. There are some devices, for example, that will return both um, NQN information for fiber channel as well as say NVMe over TCP. And your system may not dis have the capability, may not have the adapters, network connectivity to connect to those. But you'll still get errors about it with uh, the current approach. And the second thing is when you try to connect to a storage device and you can't, we typically um, will retry a bunch of times and keep displaying errors that the connection's not working, um, but we won't really display any information about why this would be. Right? Um, it could be because the device isn't allowing you access. Um, it could be because there's some kind of physical connection problem between the two. Um, could be a number of things. Um, and then when we get errors on the actual I.O., um, they can be errors for the device actually reporting on some error attempting to execute the command. Or more typically, we get errors on uh, the transport trying to connect to the device if there's a connectivity interruption. And you'll typically get error messages of the form, um, NVMe IO error minus six, and we log this, and this isn't very useful for our customer. So what I wanted to have a conversation about was sort of what do we want this to look like? Um, and do we want to have the same level of detail that we've had with other transports in the past? Or are we really trying with NVMe to 
um, make this sort of as a seamless thing as possible. Anas? So I think that the uh, current approach of having, well, uh, the bare minimum of logging is not a bad one. Because one of the things which constantly bugged us on the SCSI side is the sheer flow of information coming from the SCSI device, yeah. which um, really caused the whole system to slow down due to the well, design of Printgate. And so really the only good way of getting rid of that is simply by not printing anything. And or only print this uh, print which is absolutely necessary. So what I would love to have is to uh, delegate um, error, error messaging over to either um, dynamic debugging or even to tracing. So the um, the def the um, the pr the um, dev debug thing, and so which then use the dynamic debugging, um, or um, really helps here because that means you have to actively enable the error messages and then you will see them. Okay. And, um, but in the normal case, you simply won't have error messages, so you won't be overflow, overflow the information. That is actually the direction I would love to take and also to rely more on tracing because that allow us to, uh, allows us to, um, while really figuring out what this, the, this specific IO do while being in the stack. Mm -hmm. Sadly, there is an issue with that because um, NB multipathing kind of breaks the tracing approach because the tracing approach requires to be tracing to be enabled on each device. But for the paths, you don't really have a device which you can enable. So we can only enable tracing for the upper level, for the essentially for a struct NS head, but not for the path devices. So we will never see the actual error in the tracing because we can't enable it. And that's an issue which, well, probably would need to be addressed, but I really have no good answer how we could address it because it would mean that log trace would need to enable more than one device, which it currently simply doesn't. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I hear from our support people as far as doing things like enabling tracing to provide information, um, and this is similar to what's been done with some, uh, I know at least one fiber channel driver, is that um, often the only information we'll get if there was some kind of intermittent failure, we'll get a log file with the system log messages, but if you didn't enable tracing, none of the information's in there, and they may not be able to replicate the problem easily. And so then you tell them, okay, well, go turn on the tracing, and then the next time we'll go and connect the log messages. And it would be preferable if there was some way to have I don't know, using debug FS or something like that where you could go pull the information out um, of essentially recent activity or something. So um, the problem with doing that is then you end up buffering a whole lot of information in the kernel. This tends to not be particularly a good idea. So when you're saying a debug FS, are you saying it's on, it should be on the target side or on the host side? No, this is on the host side, right? So it has to do with... Um, the concept of your system might run along for months and be perfectly happy until there was some upset, some disturbance in your switch fabric or whatever you were using to connect to your storage. And then you get some kind of outage and you don't know what happened. And the only information you're go ever gonna get is whatever you happen to capture in a log file at the time. Um, so the trend had been to go and put more and more and more information into the logs so that if something ever happened, you'd try to have enough to try and at least start an analysis. But then what happens is if you have an outage where if you have a large number of devices, you can suddenly get flooded, like Han has said, with a huge amount of information that's not terribly useful, right? So this is what I'm talking about in terms of what should we do for NVMe relative to what we've done in the past for SCSI, is I don't necessarily want to take what we had for SCSI and try and provide the equivalent in NVMe because there are some good things and there are some bad things about what we currently have. So I guess it's like if we, if we could do it all over again, what would we want? I agree with what Kieran said about mechanisms that have to be enabled dynamically, as he's uh, uh, usually um, yeah, enabling these mechanisms after something happened is too late. So that's why Trent's gray is interesting. And if I, I'm, I'm aware in the FS that Trent's gray would do its slow patch 
uh, significantly, especially if the output was sent to a uh, serial control, because at the time, 20K was still synchronous. If I'm not mistaken, I think that 20K has been made asynchronous for that kind of purposes. So I'm, uh, I think we should take a look, a uh, closer look at uh, 20K and see whether it can be used as a mechanism for logging that kind of information. Okay. Um, another thing that comes up, um, since Han has mentioned NVMe native multipath, is that sort of the concept behind NVMe native multipath was that it was going to be more um, of a transparent thing for handling the multipath than, tr than VM has done. Um, so when you get errors when you're running with NVMe native multipath, right now, if you know exactly what messages get logged under which conditions, you can make inferences, for example, about whether you have no access to your storage because you don't have any good paths or because none of the good paths that you have uh, have an ANA state that will allow access, right? The two messages that are logged are very similar but slightly different. Um, and so one of the questions is, should we make this more explicit, sort of, you know, I can't do this I.O. because none of your paths are in the right access state. Because right now, yes, there are messages about a lot of things in NVMe. And if you can go dig into the kernel code, yes, you can go find where it got logged and infer exactly what conditions would have triggered that. But if you're a customer and don't want to go and dig into your, you know, kernel source code to figure this out, the messages aren't particularly meaningful. They're just, they, yes, they are distinct, but they're not necessarily meaningful. Um, uh, yes, um, I mean, clearly, uh, we should be updating the error message there that it's not just printing the, well, the error number, but really some meaningful thing, because even the error numbers are just the mapping of the actual error being presented by the driver into something which um, then the upper layers d do handle. Mm -hmm. So it's really pointless just to create what er error minus seven, so well, it doesn't tell you anything. Or the two logic driver printing uh, LLDD failure seven or six or something like weird stuff like that. <coughs> um, it might be an idea to just um, to formalize that that the error is actually log logged at the NVMe layer in some meaningful state, and then have it requiring the driver to provide the correct well, um, return value such that you can log up correctly and not leave it off to the drivers as it is now. Okay. So uh, on the NVMe side, it, it supports the log page. Uh, even in a target, we support error log page. That is much more... This uh, is not a, uh, in, uh, not applicable. Because yes, the target might be able to tell us what has happened, but the problem is we can't talk to the target. So an error log page doesn't really help because we can't access the log page. No, although it's interesting, you said if, if there, there is an error log page right now, do I, I'm not sure, is, we can currently read that out through NVMe CLI, correct? You can, you can read it out, right? Yes, okay, you so can, to the extent of course, that the target device could tell you something about it, you could go and, and send those commands to the target, but that's an explicit thing that right now you do from user space, right? Um, so we have, as a distribution, we have utilities in the event that we need to capture the information that goes scrape the whole system for these kinds of things. And so that is something that we could do. And right. recently, uh, uh, from Oracle, we added the logging verbose error feature. So you can tune it, and mm -hmm. you can get verbose error on the request completion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another, um, there's a th another facility that uh, Broadcom added to their fiber channel driver that essentially has a trigger that will avoid logging things until something interesting happens. And then it will display the most recent, I forget how many, but uh, things in a, a buffer. Did you um, try the recent addition of the uh, verbose logging in with, with target? Um, I'm sorry, say again? So did you try the recent addition of the NVMe uh, error logging that we have added with the verbose option configurable? Uh, no, so we haven't looked at that yet. What I was primarily concerned with is what Hannes was saying was the um, the kernel uh, NVMe core code and uh, transport drivers and multipath code, the type of logging that the kernel is performing when it detects errors either on discovery, connection, or I.O. But this is another thing that could provide more information about, particularly if there was some intermittent event and it's really about 
um, I think making this mechanism a little bit more comprehensible to an end user. So things like eliminating numeric values and error codes, um, things, things like that. So, um, I, like I said, I've had some work on this that uh, hopefully I will have more time to um, devote to in the future to uh, try and get some patches posted. Um, and so, if and when I get that in the near future, if I can get some review comments from people, that would be appreciated. Uh, that is all I had. Anybody else have anything else? Yeah, there's one thing which is um, continually bugging me also is the error messages on connect. Yeah. Because the problem is there that the connect command we send is not the connect, uh, connect command which NDME is using in the basically in the NDME protocol. Heads up, we have some people that want to ask questions on Zoom, so we're patching them through. Right, okay, okay yeah. great. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey. So I want to talk about two things that you brought up, Ewan. Uh, one is this idea of, um, you know, multiple transports being reported in the discovery log pages that, you know, that leads to, um, you know, different errors because, you know, maybe you've got a TCP transport and you've got a uh, fiber channel transport on the subsystem. And as you've noted, it depends upon the discovery service, but many of the discovery servers that, you know, that I've worked with that we've seen, they're just going to report all discovery log page entries for everything, right? right? So I think that's something that can be fixed with a patch. And a question that, that we need to ask is, do we want to actually support uh, NVMe multipath access over different transports, right? So, I mean, if you've got a TCP transport, which is really slow, and you've got a FC NVMe transport, it's like, do we really want to be trying to support multipath access over both of those transports, the same namespace? I would say no. I mean, traditionally, we discourage this for things like um, arrays that support, for example, both fiber channel and for SCSI and for iSCSI. Um, people tend not to export the same volumes as LUNs on two different transport types. There's nothing that prevents this in any of the software. It's just not necessarily a good uh, data center practice. Um, what we have seen, though, is uh, people wanting to use the same storage array over multiple transports with disjoint sets of logical units, or in the case of NVMe for disjoint namespaces. And so um, the question is, you know, to, to what extent, number one, can you actually tell, can the, I mean, can the storage array even tell that it shouldn't report this information? I mean, conceivably, it could determine that it shouldn't report discovery log pages for a different transport type than the one that it was receiving the, the uh, request on, the uh, discovery request on. But yeah, I, I agree that, about I that. Know, I, offhand, I don't even know if that's if that's uh, required by the standard. But well, there are so some no, it's not. It's it's not. It's not. Supported. And there's there are use cases in customer environments where they have a high speed primary network and a backup secondary network, and maybe they want to have you know their 100 gig Ethernet and a 8 gig fiber channel or a 128 gig fiber channel and a 10 gig Ethernet, and that might be the choice that they make in their environment. As for SCSI and NVMe, uh, there aren't any common identifiers, for it, so that would have to be set up manually. There's no way for you to automatically know that those two data sets happen to be the same by looking at any common identifier, because there just isn't a common identifier. Right. No, the, the issue right now is that, you know, if you, w with the, um, with the, uh, discovery UDEV rules for fiber channel, if you go and do the discovery, you'll get back the log page that reports transport types to which you will never be able to connect. And we will try to go and do connection requests to those, and we will always get errors. But and the storage the doesn't know that either. We don't know that you can't connect. To well, us. no, the, the, store, the storage could know that. No, I agree, you can't really, we can't really require the storage to do one way or other, but we can certainly, you know, filter things, you know, even in NVMe CLI to just say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to, we're only going to report discovery log page entries to the host, you know, uh, that match the, you know, the transport that the, that the application asked for, right? It's just a matter of, of paying attention to what the address family is or what the, you know, if you send your NVMe CLI request over an NVMe TCP transport, then you could literally just filter that out in the results that are reported back from, from uh, you know, from NVMe CLI. 
so I guess circling back to the, the higher level is, I mean, I think what we need to get to for this, for the error handling with NVMe is something that's more comprehensible than what we currently have in the kernel today, right? I mean, as kernel developers, yes, of course, we can look at it, we could probably figure it out, but those aren't gonna be the consumers of this type of stuff in an enterprise environment. So I think we need to make, we need to be a little more gentle on our users. So, so I, I, I agree, Ewan, but I still think there are two fundamental things that you brought about. One is this idea of you know, multiple transports, which in some situations is going to lead to you know, multi-pathing configurations that you know, may not, I mean, they're possible, right? But you know, I don't know if the question is, is you know, do we wanna support those, right? do our partners want to support those? And I've asked this question specifically to some of our partners, right? Uh, the second is this idea of connecting to devices with no physical link. You know, I see that as a configuration issue, right? The th I mean, filtering out large page entries based upon whether or not there's a physical link, you're never going to be able to, you know, you're never going to be able to comprehend I consider the discovery log page entry to describe what we would call a configuration space, right? And whether or not there are actual wires, you know, between the host and the, and the, and the subsystem, you know, at each of those subsystem ports is really something that's completely up to, I don't think it's anything we should try to solve that problem. That's a configuration problem. Obviously it depends on the transport type, but fiber channel, you know, with traditional SCSI, um, we don't do the discovery that way. We typically, you know, find out about the remote ports from the name service in a fabric environment, and we will only try to connect to ports that, you know, we actually can see the R port. Whereas with the NVMe discovery mechanism, the array is telling you about all of these ports that it might have somewhere that, that you have no connectivity to. So the question is whether you can know that you don't have any connectivity. But whether or not you have connectivity Right, but whether or not you have connectivity is, is something which you're never going to get that right, right? If if you if you if you try to modify things, it, and it's perfectly possible to have a link that goes down, right? So with fiber channel, if if the configuration changes, then you, then you're going to get you know the name server is going to be updated. You're going to get RSCN, right? And today, what that means is that it doesn't mean that we're going to actually you know have have to call UDEV. It just means that one of the NVMe controllers gets removed. You know, you just have one less path, right? And then when that port is plugged back in, you get another RSCN, right? And the path is restored. With NVMe TCP, it's not quite so simple as that, right? Because we don't really have like any type of a sophisticated RSCN mechanism with NVMe TCP. So I just see these all as problems, which, you know, we've been dancing around and struggling with. And I think we need to ask some fundamental questions like, you know, what is it that we want to support? And, you know, are we going to try to solve these problems? Some of which I don't think need to, need to be solved. We certainly want to streamline the error logging because we don't want to be creating errors for all these different things. But basically you're not going to lose connection to your namespace until every single path is gone, right? So I think John has uh, wanted to have a, another topic uh, later on, uh, either yeah. today or this week, on specifically on uh, uh, on these different TPs on NVMe discovery. So. Uh, All right. So I'll go. I'll go back on mute. <laughs> to finish your topic. Um, do we have anybody else on online? So, um, there's one thing which I wanted to raise. That's again the errors on connect, um, but. We do submit quite some, uh, so we sub just submit a string of arguments, and then the driver has to figure out which is which and do the actually connect underneath. Mm -hmm. And um, but the return we are getting is just an error code. So, in case if the arguments are wrong for whatever reason or not being accepted by either the controller or the NVMe stack or something, um, we have no way of figuring out which of the argument was it was which caused the failure. Occasionally, you do get something, some information by looking in the message log, but then again, this is not really a, a nice way of, of doing error handling. So really, we should be, ideally, we would have a way where we could either return a pointer or some indication at which point 
the parsing failed in the connect string. I mean so, th and this is actually something that, that was pointed out by uh, our QE engineer who uh, works with me on this stuff in that it's actually worse than that because when you do an NVMe CLI command to do a connect, for example, um, it's not a synchronous thing, right? What that does is it, it instantiates a kernel object to do the connection, which will then sit off and asynchronously try to reconnect. If you can't connect, it will not return an error on the syscall to the right for the uh, NVMe yes. connect command. The, the other so the command actually comes back and says, sure, I did it. And the kernel's off trying to connect to this thing that isn't going to work, and you just get a bunch of error messages. The and other problem you have. feedback to any kind of script in user space or anything that it didn't work. The, the other problem you have, Ewan, is that the error reporting is error synchronous, is asynchronous. Right. That when you send an NVMe command, it will come back and tell you that it was either successful or it failed. If you want to know exactly what failed, you have to go look at the error log entry, the log page. And then you have to match up a log page entry with the command that you sent to look for the details which will point to the field within the command that tells you what's wrong. But they're completely asynchronous. Right. Two sets of commands with no connection except some random command identifier. And it, as long as you didn't overflow the log with too many errors or send too many commands. So uh, there is a mechanism there to do it, but I, it doesn't scale very well, quite honestly. Yeah, it's a well, bit and like and this sort of begs the question, too, whether you really want to implement that kind of state tracking in the kernel or whether you want to have some user space thing that can collect this information and tell you. You, you can't, because that's the, as Fred said, the error log is tied to the, um, to the command ID. Mm -hmm. And the command ID is completely e ephemeral. You, user space doesn't know anything about the command ID. So he w it w wouldn't have a notion how it could track it. Plus, that by that time, user space gets along to actually asking for information, the command ID might have been reused. So you have no track whatsoever what really has happened. It's essentially a bit like the old request send, uh, sense command on SCSI. It's actually the very same thing. Well, it's actually modeled after ATA. And yeah, the way they did right. the ATA, ATA so rather than the so SCSI auto it sense. So and it doesn't yeah. really, it's not that we can't handle it. I mean, we do it in ATA. We actually do retrieve the error log page in the error handler, figuring out the information and set the correct bits when it returns the command. Yes, you can do it. It's slow as hell and basically kills all your performance you might ever had. But yeah, it's doable. The question is whether we need to do it because as of now, we don't. And surprise, surprise, this is not an area where customers have been complained about. What the customers have been complained about in errors running up to that point where you could retrieve the error log page or any command whatsoever, because that's really where the issue is. What do we do if there's a failure somewhere in the chain before the command is being sent or processed by the controller? That is not being handled consistently or not at all occasionally. All right, we're, we're at 1.30, so. Okay. Uh, I next up, we have James Smart to talk about commonization of NVMe transports. James here. <laughs> 